We are moving on to verse 5. We'll start there today. Jonah chapter 1, continuing with the narrative. In verse 5, the mariners were afraid and each cried and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. And so the mariners being afraid emphasizes just how bad of a storm this is because these are professional, lifelong seamen who have traveled the sea for the entirety of their lives and they're afraid, afraid to the point that they are tossing their cargo overboard. Their cargo is the reason for the trip. That's how they're getting paid. That is the very reason that they're making this dangerous voyage to begin with. And yet, this storm is so bad, they're eventually getting to the point where they say, it's not about the money, it's not about completing the purpose or the mission here, it is about staying alive. It's not just a, a, you know, a narrative point that they're throwing their cargo over, the, over into the sea to lighten the boat for them, which would essentially, the understanding is, it would cause the boat, the ship to be lighter and wouldn't sink down as far in between the waves and would therefore take on less water, right? So that was the point of them throwing the cargo over the ship, but it's not just that they were trying to lighten the load. They were saying nothing else matters at this point besides staying alive, not their livelihood, not their, not their jobs or careers. It's just staying alive. So that's all to emphasize the reality that they were living in, the seriousness of this tempest, right? How, how dangerous it was and to shake up professional seafarers like that, it must have been um, a pretty serious, a pretty serious storm. You, you note here that the, the narrator says that, um, and they each cried out to his own God. And you guys have heard that phrase, there are no atheists in foxholes. It's kind of hard to um, button down all the way to it who said it first or who made it famous, but the story goes that it was um, a a captain and a a lieutenant and a sergeant in a foxhole in the Philippines during World War II um, where the situation they were in was obviously pretty grim and they both started praying audibly. And after they had made it out of that, the the sergeant was talking to a reporter and uh, he was overheard saying there's there's no there's no such thing as atheists and foxholes right whenever you're in that type of situation where it's life or death or death seems imminent and threatening you're calling out to god to some god and we see here that's what the mariners were doing that the situation was grim enough that they were calling out each to their own god and the story says here that Jonah, but Jonah, right? When you read, it says, but Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship. So I want you guys to think through this with me. Uh, sorry, that's so small there, but there's two ways to interpret this, this clause here, that but Jonah. And so, and in the Hebrew grammar and syntax, there is no... <clears throat> Just according to the way it is written, there is no stronger case for one or the other. So either the narrator at this point when he says, but Jonah, he's providing some sort of background information in the sense that all this is going on, and when he says, but Jonah, what he means is, by the way, Jonah's been asleep this whole time. Right? Or the narrator is, the, the translation is to be understood concurrent. <clears throat> excuse me, or depicting a sequence of events. So it's either, by the way, Jonah's been sleeping this whole time, or the narrator is saying, Jonah's, Jonah's on the top deck. He sees the storm, he feels the waves, he sees everyone crying out to their own God and throwing their livelihood off the, the side of the boat and says, I think I'm going to go lay down for a little bit. So, what are you guys' thoughts? I want you guys to think through this with me. What is it? 
How, how would you, have you heard it interpreted before? What are your first thoughts that come to mind? What, um, what support do you have? What are you thinking? It's either the background information, Jonah's been sleeping the whole time. Um, just want you guys to know this because it's a pretty integral part of the story. Or I want you to know that Jonah is seeing all of this and then decides he's going to go down to the bottom of the ship and take a nap. Yeah, Bill. Okay. The rest of the text says that the captain came and said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise and call out to your God. So he came and woke him up. Right. So it could be that he was witnessing them throwing the stuff over and everything. It sounds like he was already down there sleeping and then they came and got him up. Yeah, and the one tough thing about most narrative, and this one in particular, is that we're not quite sure how much time passes between you know, each episode or each conversation or dialogue. Um, you know, we, we, have, we have no idea how much time happened from when Jonah got the call to God, from God, to when he arrives in Joppa. We don't know how long after he gets to Joppa does the ship actually take off, right? I mean, the story moves quickly intentionally because the narrator wants to highlight certain points of the story. Um, and so for that reason, we're not always sure how much time has elapsed between. Um, so it could have been that Jonah has been asleep and all this goes on and the captain runs downstairs and he's like, what are you doing? Um, or it could be that this has been going on for hours and the captain finally says, where's Jonah? I'm going to go, right. But that's what I'm saying, though. The, the context, even, you know, we, we, can't, we don't have the grammar and the syntax to rely on. Um, and even the context can be difficult to help us uh, persuade one or the other. Yeah, Renata. Yeah, and I actually think that there is a case for option two in that I think Jonah was in a perpetual state of denial. When God told him to go to Nineveh, he turned in the opposite direction. He went to Tarshish. When he saw the storm coming up, he just said, I can't, I can't deal with this, so I'm going downstairs and I'm going to sleep. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there's a case for either option. You just, um, I suppose you can, you can try to debate it, but I, I think either one is plausible. Yeah. And, and intentionally, it's, it's left that way. Yeah, Adam. Is inconsistent with the second option. Okay. So if you're going to say that the storm was the foxhole for the mariners, and that no one can be in the foxhole without panic, then we can't. You would imply that that's true, and that Jonah did the opposite of what you just said is true. Well, and I think one of the main purposes of this this story is to highlight the contrast between. The one who is a, a person of God, right, a, a prophet of God, and the one who is a pagan. And just how completely upside down and backwards the prophet of God, the man would God resp of God responds in situations um, and how backwards it is that the pagans respond to God and his activity. So I think there's something, too, even in just the uh, literary element of the fact that Jonah is always doing the exact opposite of a universal truth. There are no atheists in foxholes, except maybe for Jonah. It also showed just he didn't care about the uh, Ninevites. He doesn't care about these pagans either, just an apathy. Just like, I, I don't care about these people. <clears throat> That's probably going to save them too. I'm, yeah. I'm a, it's, it's so ironic that they're praying he's not. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point to make. All right, any other thoughts, Adam? <laughs> good, this is good. Thank you for doing this with me because this is uh, what I had been working through. Um, and so that's just kind of part of the process, at least part of my process. Um, I will say without, you know, um, uh, I can't say I'm, I'm sold, but... I lean towards the, 
the second interpretation, the concurrent or sequence of events. I think it fits with what the narrator is trying to pull out of this story, is that Jonah is always defying expectations. He's always doing the exact opposite of what you would expect him to. Not only that, it, it does fall in line with what Skip was saying, right? He, he, he doesn't care, he doesn't seem to care about anyone else's life. He, he's, I, th I think it's, you know, I, I mean, it's conjecture, obviously, but I think it's quite possible um, that Jonah saw what was going on and, and said, who cares? I, uh, one commentator even points out, it's apparent that Jonah already has a death wish. This could be the first hint that we get as we read the story of Jonah's death wish, is that he just, he doesn't, he doesn't care anymore. He doesn't care whether he lives or dies. He certainly doesn't care whether pagans live or die. Um, so I just thought that was interesting and something maybe you wouldn't have had to wrestle with or wrestle through um, if you hadn't read the Hebrew like me and I am fluent in Hebrew, so. Scott, yeah. I just want to point out it shows his pride because he would rather die than go to Nineveh and have them turn to God because he hated, he hated them that much what they did those kind of people how could you think of that guy he would rather die don't send me I'd rather die than do that and that's pretty much the whole story that's his name good and even still we have even the, the pagans calling out to their gods and Still, up to this point, we have no record of any dialogue um, or any response from Jonah to God, to Yahweh. Jonah hasn't responded, even as he's... Oh, no, I'm getting ahead of myself. Hold on. That's the next verse. Um, one interesting note to point out, this word for sleep is, is, not, is different than um, just normal, regular, getting a good night's rest. Uh, in the Hebrew, the word for sleep here is the same word, the deep sleep that God caused Adam to fall into so that he could take from Adam and, and create Eve. Uh, this is also the same word in other places in the Old Testament where God communicated to people through dreams and visions. Um, so this, the, the narrator here chooses a word that is not just like he went, he went down for a nap, right? He was... He was in a, a, a certain kind of deep sleep. How can you sleep at a time like this, right? In, in, in one six. So, what is going on? Oh, <laughs> I was like, man, I put some fancy animation in there. Um, so the captain came and said, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God, perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. One interesting thing that we might not get, um, it might be easier to catch in the Hebrew, is, I uh, like one commentator says, Jonah must have thought he was in a nightmare, right? Because arise and call out were two of the three imperatives that God gave to Jonah, right? And so Jonah wakes up in the middle of this storm and from a deep sleep, and the first words he hears are the same words repeated to him, uh, the words that he's running from, arise, and call out. Uh, the third imperative that God gave was to um, go to Nineveh, right? But still the same idea. So if you can imagine Jonah waking up from this deep sleep, groggy, maybe not sure what's going on, and, and he might have felt like he's in some type of, Inception movie or something, right? Or just some nightmare because the first words he hears are the same words that Yahweh said to him, right? And so I just, I just like that um, with something we might not have caught in, in just a, a cursory reading of it. But so he's, but what's the question? How can you sleep at a time like this? Call out to your God. Whatever God may help us in this moment. So Apparently, the mariners have already been calling out to their own gods. They have thrown their cargo overboard. They have done what they could to save themselves, and nothing is working. But they recognize someone's missing, right? Um, there's one person who hasn't called out to whatever god they have. And so 
the, the captain goes and wakes him up. How can you sleep at a time like this? Call out to your God. Our gods haven't responded. Maybe, maybe your God will. So they don't know um, who to pray to. They don't know who's in control of this. Hold on. Or, uh, yeah, Acts 17, 23, when Paul is at the Areopagus and he's, he's uh, talking about the, the altar of the unknown God. Um, this, is, this is in line with that, right? Just kind of catch all. We just need to engage every God or even any gods we can't think of or haven't thought of yet. We need, uh, it's not working yet, so we need to, it's kind of all hands on deck. Let's, let's, um, let's see who's going to respond to our call for help. Um, perhaps the God will give a thought to this or a thought to us, right? There's, it, the first thing that jumped out to me is just the stark contrast between a pagan's worship and expectation of their God's response and care and compassion and sympathy to the Christian's expectation and confidence that they can have when they call out to their God, right? To Yahweh, to our God, to our creator, redeemer. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us. They are in a storm, likely a storm they have never seen before, maybe couldn't even imagine, right? They're willing to give up their livelihood. They're calling out to their gods, and it's not working, so they get Jonah, and they say, call out to your God. Perhaps he will give a thought to us. All they have is perhaps. All, all they have is that maybe he'll hear us, maybe he won't, maybe he'll care, maybe he won't, maybe he'll do something, maybe he won't. And what just jumps out at me is that, that we do not get to or nor should we approach God that way, right? We know God is near. We know God cares. We know God hears, right? And we know <clears throat> that whatever thought he gives to us is a good thought. We don't have to wonder if he gives a thought to us. We don't have to wonder if he's hurt us. Um, sometimes we wrestle with what his thought towards us is, or how he has decided to respond to that situation. Um, and that's usually based on whether we like it or not. But we don't have to question. We can't ask ourselves, perhaps our God will give a thought to us. When we call out to our God, we know that he hears us. We know that he cares. Um, we know that it matters to him. And he will do more than a thought or give more than a thought to us. Um, he will act rightly and kindly towards us. Any comments or thoughts up to this point? Okay, moving on. Verse 7, they said to one another, come, let us cast lots, that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So, like it's already been mentioned, we have no reason to believe up to this point that Jonah has called out to Yahweh. Even being woken up in the middle of the storm, even being invited to pray, we still don't have any evidence or reason to believe that he's actually done this. We actually have reason to believe, to the contrary, that the prophet, the one who is sent by God to speak, has still remained silent, right? He's still not offered any explanation um, or any reasoning or even pray to his own God, to Yahweh. We have reason to believe the contrary because they still have to figure this out, right? It's not as if uh, Jonah has given them a response and they thought, okay, that should, that should um, help settle things, at least in our own minds. They're still on this search for we have to do something. We have to figure this out because, as we'll read in a couple of verses, the storm's getting worse. It's not getting better. It's not even saying the same. It's getting worse. And so they, they have to figure out what, uh, on whose account this evil will come upon us. So, so they cast lots. And this was an ancient Near Eastern um, practice of decision-making. We see it throughout Scripture uh, multiple times. Joshua 18.10, um, the land distribution to the different tribes was um, decided by casting lots. Acts 1.26, when they needed 
a twelfth to replace Judas. They cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias. Um, and then in Joshua 7, the sin of Achan. You guys remember the sin of Achan? Um, where they had gone into Jericho, and, and God said, don't take anything from Jericho, but Achan does, and nobody knows about it. This, this is something Achan has done in secret. And so they move on to Ai, and that's supposed to be, uh, that's a shoe in right? They're supposed to, even to the point where um, they only send but a, a, a portion of their army to go take care of Ai because the Lord has already given us this battle. This is, uh, this is a gimme. So they go and they're defeated and they lose 36 men and they're wondering what's going on the, um, and that they're told, cast lots, right? Somebody has disobeyed the Lord, we, we cast lots. And uh, so that's what Joshua did. He casted lots and Achan was found out as the one who had, who had taken um, some of the spoils of battle from, from Jericho. And so Old Testament and even um, in Acts, we have a New Testament example of casting lots. And this wasn't coincidence or chance, right? They understood that the process of casting lots was giving God the opportunity to communicate his will uh, to them. Right, So when they would say, we will cast lots for this, it was the equivalent of saying, God will, God will make this decision for us. He will make it known to us through this process. Bruce? Proverbs 16 says, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision of the Lord. Right. The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. So this, was, um, this wasn't just uh, a Hebrew practice. Right, this, the, it's the pagans are the ones who suggest let's cast lots. So it's an ancient Near Eastern pat, uh, process of hearing from the divine and the divine communicating their will and their decision uh, to its people. Okay, sorry. Uh, I wonder, in, and sometimes I, I, I read scripture and I, I kind of put myself in that situation. And um, Adam reminded me this morning that this was, um, if you guys have watched the VeggieTales version of Jonah, right? Because I was, I was sharing with Adam this morning, I was saying like, you know, I wonder if Jonah, right, he's sleeping, he's woken up, and he's told to pray, everyone else is praying, he still doesn't pray, he still refuses to acknowledge or turn to Yahweh, and um, so like, all right, everything that's happened so far hasn't worked, we need to cast lots. And I, I wonder if, if Jonah, knowing the practice and the history, the documented history of casting lots, and believing that God, God does communicate through that process, I wonder if he's sitting there thinking, Oh, oh no! Please, please, no! Let's not cast lots. Let's talk about this. You know, let's uh, we can let's put our heads together. Let's figure this out. I wonder if he's like, they're gonna find me out if they cast lots. There's gonna be no question as to um, as to whose account this evil has come upon us. Right? And apparently, uh, the Jonah of Veggie Tales experience is the same plight. Right? Is that correct? Yeah, they're playing ghost like flooding. <laughs> I didn't source VeggieTales for this. I should have, but um, so yeah. So me and VeggieTales were we think alike. <laughs> Skip. I just can we see an episode of that in class? Mm -hmm. We need to. Yeah. Ignore that. <laughs> I think we could. Yeah. But I wonder, you know, I mean, Jonah, who is intentionally defiant, refusing at every opportunity, even the opportunity the pagans put on a silver platter in front of him, please call out to your God. Still, he remains silent. And um, they're on a mission, right? They need to know how to settle the sea. And so what do they know? What do they do? 
They cast lots, and, and it, it must be. I just, I just can't help but think what Jonah's going through. Either he does have a death wish, right? And he's like, well, the lot will, find, the lot will, will land on me, and it'll be over, and we'll be done with it. Or maybe he's so prideful enough, or maybe he's so um, just hopeful enough that the lot will fall on someone else, right? He's on a ship with a bunch of pagans, and nobody knows, nor has anyone admitted to this point, who's offended their God, right? Um, so maybe Jonah's hoping, well, it's, it's possible that the lot would fall on someone else. Surely this, this group of rough mariners has done something to offend their own God. So maybe even still, he's hoping he can get away with something. Um, maybe not. Maybe he's like, yeah, this is... This is where they find me out. Any thoughts or comments? Any questions about that? Uh, and just uh, one note there, divine providence, right? We understand that this is one of the main themes of the book of Jonah, is that, that God is in control. Divine providence. God hurls the wind at the sea. God appoints the fish, um, uh, God appoints the plants, he appoints the worm, right? God is in control, uh, he is sovereign over all, and this is a, a recurring theme throughout the book. And so, the lot falls on Jonah, and uh, this isn't small talk. This isn't, hey, where are you, where are you from? What, what's, your, what's your occupation? What do you do for work, right? This isn't, they're not making small talk here. They want to know, they want to know who Jonah is and what he's about. So the lot is, falls on Jonah. They say to him, "Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And what people are you?" All right? These are questions we might ask someone who we're meeting for the first time, but these people are are aiming at something different here. They don't want general information about Jonah. Maybe um, you know a, for, a friendship could form out of this. Now, they want some answers, right? The lot has spoken. Um, divine providence has been, has been in, in, enacted here. So now we need some answers. Tell us on whose account, <coughs> excuse me, this evil has come from or has come upon us, excuse me. Um, right, they want to they wanna make sure. If they're going to act on Jonah now, they need to make sure that, um, that Jonah comes forward, that Jonah confesses, that he admits. And then, what is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? What people are all you? What, of what people are you? Um, these are all questions aimed at asking Jonah or hearing from Jonah, who is your God? Who do you worship? What God have we offended? And what God is responsible for this near-death experience for this storm that we're in the middle of, right? And so they, they are, they're trying to find out from Jonah who's mad at us or who's mad at you specifically, right? The lot landed on you. Who's mad at you? What God have you offended? And so he answers rightly. He understands the question, right? He doesn't, he doesn't go on to answer these questions as if this is purely let's, let's talk about this. Let's get to know each other a little bit. Right? He answers these questions because they know what the questions are for. Right? Who's mad at us? What God have you, Jonah, offended? And he starts with, I am a Hebrew. And that is um, very customary, very common greeting or introduction of an Israelite to a foreigner. We see this even in Exodus when Moses and Aaron are before Pharaoh. Right? That is their introduction. We are, um, we are Hebrew. And so, this, uh, this, and there's other instances throughout the Old Testament where the same introduction is given. It was understood that the, the statement, I am a Hebrew, tells you who I am and what God I worship. And so, he starts with that, right? He starts with, here's what, here's the information you're looking for. Here's what you want to know. I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. I don't know about you guys, but my first initial reaction to reading that is, 
No, you don't. You don't fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. But yet, as far as we know, the first time Jonah opens his mouth, after much provocation, after some pretty serious um, episodes and, and circumstances, the first thing he says is, I'm a Hebrew, I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. So the first thing he says is that he fears uh, a sovereign God, a providential God, a one who has made everything, who is present at all times in the middle of fleeing from that same God. So his first statement about God is completely contrary to the very point in life that he's at. He's trying to flee God, and the first thing he says about God um, is that God is sovereign. God is in control. He is over everything, and he is in control of everything. I like uh, to bring up a quote C.S. Lewis here. He says, for you will certainly carry out God's purpose however you act, but it makes a difference to you whether you serve like Judas or like John. Right, and that's, and that's C.S. Lewis. And I think that's what we see here in Jonah. Right? Look at Jonah's first words recorded in this story is this proclamation of who God is. What is what, the reason he's on this boat is because he's trying not to do this. Right? He's trying not to go tell people about God, um, and in this case, Nineveh, and God's displeasure with them and God's coming judgment on them. But his whole purpose for even being on this ship is, is so that he doesn't have to proclaim the word of the Lord or, or who God is. He's fleeing that very mission. He's fleeing that very presence. And yet, the first thing he says is a proclamation about about the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. He was okay with dying with, by God, a merciful God, but now he's in front of these essentially pirates who, you know, they might scam him or hang him up or something, and he's like trying to give himself credence to mm -hmm. not get tortured or, you know, violently killed. Okay. Um, uh, if I'm understanding you, the, like, listen, I fear the Lord. You don't want to mess with me. Yeah. Adam. One of the things that this highlights for me, and I think it's highlighted over and over again throughout Jonah, is there can be a very real disconnect between our intellect and our emotions and our will. Mm -hmm. um, we can have a lot of knowledge, a lot of head knowledge about God, and especially when it comes to sin, it, it, it will, um, that, that head knowledge will not move over into how we, what we do and to how we feel, how we respond. I mean, it takes... It takes him getting being in the belly of a fish to say the right thing <laughs> and, and and to speak to God to from his heart call out for for mercy and compassion. Yeah, sorry, just one more thing. If you're looking at it from a literary aspect, it's it's the climax of the story. It's been building and building and building to this point, and now it's going to resolve itself. And we get to this point where the prophet whose mission, whose purpose as sent by God is to speak, and we finally get to this point through this, these intense circumstances where he finally speaks, and the thing he speaks is the thing he's running from, right? And so um, once again, you know, this, this contrast, this um, contradiction of expectation, right? At this point, I don't know that we would expect Jonah to answer this way. At this, at this point, Jonah making this proclamation seems uncharacteristic, right? It seems like if God himself has told you, Jonah, to go do this, um, and you will intentionally, decisively go the exact opposite direction, I don't expect you to answer a bunch of mariners about um, who you are and, and who God is. Yeah, Bill. <laughs> but uh, we were having a conversation a couple weeks ago about this, about did John really believe he could flee from the presence of the Lord? Mm -hmm. And I think this gentleman that is really close by to me made an excellent <laughs> <laughs> He said that sin and disobedience is irrational. Mm -hmm. And we both felt like that he, he thought he maybe could flee the presence of the Lord, but it's because of the irrationality of it. 
Uh, I will... I will quote someone not quite as intelligent as, as your good friend, who shall rename anonymous, um, if I can find it. Well, never mind. Why are you doing that? I guess the reason I said that is because maybe this is the first time he's had to face up to what his true beliefs were versus what he was thinking in the past, that he thought he could get away from God. Yeah, uh, yes. Well, sorry. I had something. But it is gone. All right. Um, anyone else have anything? I'm trying to, trying to stall for like one more minute before, instead of moving into the next slide. Yeah. And along with all this, it's like sometimes we probably all talk to someone about the Lord, and they, they were born and raised in a church, and the first thing they say, no matter how they're living, is, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Um, and that, that thought comes to my mind, too. Mm-hmm. I'm not denying it. I'm not denying what Bill's intellectual friend said. It's very true. Yeah, yeah it is. And, and we talked about that. Uh, towards the beginning of the class or uh, a few weeks ago in that there is some, uh, it might have seemed easy for Jonah to disobey the Lord, right? He gets, he, he gets up, he gets to Joppa. As far as we know, it's an unimpeded journey. He's able to travel to Joppa. He gets to Joppa and he finds a ship going to the furthest point that as far as they're concerned, the furthest point of the known world in, in Tarshish, um, and all he has to do is pay a fare and hop on, and he'll be taken far away from the presence of the Lord. How easy all of that, how, how those steps must have just fallen into place for Jonah, right? Um, but that's, that's the disillusionment um, and the deceit of sin. Okay, nice, good, you guys. You guys stalled it out for an extra minute. So we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up there, and um, let's pray. Let's pray for the, for the service to come, and then we'll be dismissed. Father, we do thank you for your word that you've given to us. God, we, we always ask that you would help us to treat it rightly, to treat it um, with the respect and the attention that it deserves. God, help us to always see in your word um, an arrow that points back to you, that points to your son Jesus and the gospel, what he did for us, uh, even especially as we study Jonah. God, help us to see the explicit gospel of your son Jesus in this text. Uh, God, we pray that this, this time this morning has been good for edification. It has built us up. It has um, deepened our understanding for you and our love for you. God, we pray that you were pleased. You were glorified with our time here together. We pray for the, the same thing for the next hour, that you would be pleased, you would be glorified, you would be lifted up, and that you would work in and among us that we might be built up and conformed to the image of your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.